Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to another episode of Sri's daily global COVID-19 show. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and it's my honor to host this daily conversation. We cover various aspects of the COVID-19 crisis, including the health crisis, the financial crisis, as well as the racial inequality crisis. Today, we have a very special show for you. You will be meeting Maria Ressa. This is episode number 134, that we've been live for 134 days. No vacation, no weekends, as we deal with the lockdown, the quarantine, and the crisis. Maria Ressa is a crusading journalist from the Philippines, Times 2018 Person of the Year. We'll be talking to her after she appeared in court on July 22nd to plead not guilty of tax evasion. The Philippines convicted her and her former colleague, Ray Santos Jr. of cyber libel and other charges amounting to an attack on press freedom. The former CNN journalist is the founder and CEO of Rappler, a new site that has been critical of President Rodrigo Duterte. Ressa has been released on bail pending appeal and could face six years in prison. She says, we are meant to be a cautionary tale we are meant to make you afraid. Tonight, I will be joined by one of our producers of this show, journalist and founder of the hashtag Women to Follow, Rose Horowitz. She's at Rose Horowitz 31, and Maria is at Maria Ressa. We'll meet Maria in just a couple of minutes. Please tag and share with your friends. We're live on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on LinkedIn. Please share this so that folks can join us right now. Hi, everyone. I'm Sri, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm also the co-founder of DigiMentors, a social, digital, and virtual events consulting business. We tell people, don't cancel your in-person event and don't convert it into virtual without talking to us first. My email is right on the screen, sri at sri.net. Thank you so much for being here. We want to thank our producers, Rose Horowitz, who you'll meet in just a minute, and Vandana Menon, Vandana underscore Menon. She is tweeting and sharing the content here. Hope you're doing, the, doing that as well. We're live on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube right now. The archives for our shows can be found on YouTube, youtube.com slash srinet. Before we bring on Maria, I want to thank our sponsors, including Muckrack Academy, Fundamentals of Social Media, a free certification now available for journalists, PR pros, and everyone. More than 4,000 people have taken this course. Please go to mrac.co slash social, mrac.co slash social. Please check it out and please join us. I learned a lot putting this together and so will you. We also want to thank the folks who produce She's On Call, a new medical and health show run by two of my surge, uh, surgeon friends, Dr. Sujana Chandrasekhar and Dr. Marina Kurian. They interview senior doctors, physicians, nurses on their show, and it's every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Please join us for She's On Call, 11 a.m. Sunday, every Sunday and follow them on Facebook and on Twitter and on YouTube. And before we bring on Maria, we also want to tell you about our show tomorrow night. We have a change of pace. We're going to be watching and talking about Netflix's Indian matchmaking, the big top 10 show around the world on Netflix. And we'll be joined by Smithy Mundra, executive producer of Indian matchmaking and the Oscar nominated director of St. Louis Superman and will be joined by Vyasar Ganeshan, who's a part participant in Indian matchmaking. This is part of a new monthly series with In Diaspora, a very important nonprofit that works to have, expand the impact of the Indian diaspora. And founder M.R. Rangaswamy will be with us tomorrow. Please tune in at 9 p.m. Eastern time. We're also very grateful to our friends at scroll.in, one of India's leading websites for live streaming and partnering with us on this show. In our first 125 episodes, we've had a million 
viewers and 88 million social impressions. We've had 234 guests, including 143 women, 48 cities, 13 countries of speakers, doctors, nurses, authors, journalists, lawyers, CEOs, teachers, professors, and check out our archives at youtube.com slash Srinet. We're always looking for speaker suggestions, sponsorship suggestions, and please email me sri at sri.net. Let me bring on Rose Horowitz to say hello to all of you. Hi, Rose. Hi, so excited to be here. <laughs> There's always a big guest, but this is really big for us. So very excited. Thank you for all your work. How have you managed to work with us for 134 days through the <laughs> pandemic? And how are you doing and how's your family? We're all fine. And um, I, I got out let yesterday to try to go to the beach and, and my friend brought me some flowers for my birthday, which is next week. So they are in the back uh, behind me, some lilies. And uh, so I guess I've survived by having my family around and uh, being able to watch plants grow. <laughs> and you've got very dramatic lighting on those flowers behind you. So that's wonderful. <laughs> And with that, are we ready to bring on Maria? I think so. Yes. So everyone, we'll just tell everybody again what we're about to do and who you're about to meet. One of the world's most influential, most critically influential and impactful journalists. Everybody, please welcome onto our stage right now, Maria Ressa. Hi. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. I watch the flowers grow. I think we have to be zen now, right? <laughs> the, the, the lilies are in the back with the scent. So, yeah. Maria, I have to first ask you, how are you doing? How is your family through this crisis? Uh, my parents are actually in the U.S. They're, of course, extremely worried. Um, my, my family is scattered. Uh, and... I'm doing my best to say, stop worrying. Nothing's in our control. You know, it's the serenity prayer, right? You take care of what you can control, which means doing journalism, continually doing that. Um, we just rolled out a new tech platform on our site, uh, keeping our team together. And um, your question is, how am I doing? Um, ups and downs, because, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time learning anger management the last four years, uh, still shocked. Um, but in general, I know, you know, it's funny, the last two days, I went back over all of the books I have at home on, on the 70s, 1969 to 1975, which is, you know, when martial law was declared in the Philippines, how we transitioned from what was a democracy to a dictatorship. And there are too many things that are similar. So, wow, long answer to your first question, which is, I guess, where am I? Um, depends on what time you ask me. Uh, what uh, Right now, I'm caffeined and good and um, I guess resolute. You know, it's funny because one of the first things you said about me was crusading. I never really, I immediately, you know, recoiled because I'm a journalist. But uh, in today's landscape, when we have to fight for the facts, and literally we have to fight for the facts because uh, um, because social media platforms spread lies faster than facts. We are on social media platforms, right? We are competing for attention. Um, when you're fighting for facts, journalists are activists. So, okay, fine. I'm a crusade. A crusader. I'm a crusader for facts. You will. We'll take that crusader for facts. And everybody who's watching, please share this. Tag your friends. This will be live now and available as a recording right after this. So we want everybody to watch and learn as we talk not just about the Philippines but also about Asia and what's happening all over the world as journalism is under attack in so many ways. In America, we're told the press is the enemy of the people and many other things are happening that are a problem. I also want to point out that Maria is joining us while we talk about other crises. She has her own crisis to deal with, as we have been saying. So she just got out of her last tangle with the law. And maybe you can explain exactly what the case is, where it stands. And then we're going to bring in Rose to ask you some more questions. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this was two days ago. I uh, uh, 
it's tax evasion. It's one of five cases on tax evasion. So first, I have eight arrest warrants, right? And those were issued in 2019. In 2018, the government filed 11 cases and investigations against me and Rappler. We're not doing anything but journalism, but obviously, uh, they want us to stop, <laughs> which which makes me laugh because every time they push, we push back harder. So this case the other day was uh, it's it's again laughable, like all of the cases. But this is for failure to report uh, value added tax. So they assess that we owe something like two hundred thousand pesos. This is the company, uh, Rappler Rappler Holdings, and. Um, at, at that arraignment, instantaneously, the Department of Justice prosecutor verbally added uh, the company. Because this actually proves to you how I was targeted because the information, which is what the arrest warrant is based on, the charge sheet, only included me. And then minutes before the actual arraignment, uh, the prosecutor, the Department of Justice added the company belatedly almost two years after they issued this charge sheet, right? Um, so they added Rappler Holdings, uh, the arraignment went on. But the irony of this, of course, is that how can you pay value added tax when you don't actually have any sales, right? So in order to file these tax evasion charges, the government uh, re reclassified our holding company to a dealer in securities, like we're a stock brokerage house. So this is almost as ludicrous as the case I was convicted on on June 15th, which is cyber libel. Uh, in order to actually do that, the government, the court had to change the statute of limitations for libel from one year to 12 years. So this is essentially a retroactive application of a law for a story Rappler wrote in 2012. Anyway, let me not go. It's a whole slew of cases. Um, I just laugh now because these cases should never even have gotten to court. But, um, but it, you know, <laughs> political harassment, intimidation, these are politically motivated cases. So, yes, I laugh. Well, it's amazing that you can laugh in the middle of all of this. So we salute you for your bravery. Can you just set the scene of what is happening in the Philippines with press freedom and how it's all being affected by what's happening today with coronavirus? and how the Philippines is handling that as well, if you can make that scene for us. Wow, it's huge. All right, so let me first say it's been four years, four years of constant attacks. President Duterte was elected May 2016, you know, and then after that, a month later was Brexit, after that, then your own elections in the United States. With the, um, look, I think we were the beginning of the dominoes that fell, that showed you how cheap armies on social media can can erode democracy, the tech-enabled rise of authoritarian-style leaders. Um, in 2016, the attacks were exponential bottom-up on social media. Uh, part of the reason we were targeted and I was targeted was uh, uh, we published a three-part series on the weaponization of social media, of the weaponization of the internet. That was in 2016, three-part series. The first was you know, what happened with the propaganda war um, government officials now joining in that. Uh, the second was how Facebook algorithms impact democracy. I wrote these two pieces. The third was manufactured consensus, how 26 fake accounts can influence up to 3 million other Facebook accounts. Um, that along with uh, imp so impunity of social media platforms of Silicon Valley versus impunity of the drug war, because that was the real reason why the Duterte administration focused on me and Rappler. Um, and then after these exponential bottom-up attacks, the government came top down. In 2017, uh, President Duterte and officials began to attack us. The same narrative that was coming bottom up. In 2018, uh, the government weaponized the law. 11 cases and investigations in about 12 months. Uh, sorry, in 14 months. And then in 2019, arrest warrants, eight arrest warrants. I was arrested twice in a five-week period uh, and then detained overnight, just so that the, I could feel the government's power. They made sure, um, again, all I had to do, all I could do was laugh, right? Anger, because that's, I'm so, I'm so angry that we are at this state where uh, journalism is equals criminal activities. And then 2020, of course, 
Uh, June 15th, I was convicted along with a former colleague, Ray Santos. Uh, so if you look at that, the evolution and the role of technology in 2016, the narrative of journalist equals criminal was thrown into our information ecosystem. In 2016, very, very easy for me to laugh because by next year, I'll have been a journalist for 35 years. And I have a long track record and I've lived a lot of my life publicly. Um, but with, repeat, with repetition, when you say it a million times, people begin to look around and say, hey, I heard this, I heard this. It's what social media does. The lie becomes a fact with repetition. And then when government comes top down, government gives it an imprimatur and the propaganda networks, the disinformation networks are hitting journalist equals criminal. And then by 2020, I mean, when you get arrested, they it's it's fodder for that disinformation network. And then in and after I was uh, uh, convicted, journalist equals criminal, right? So uh, this is how death by demo death of a thousand cuts of our democracy happens. This is how you make alternative realities a reality. And that's so sad that that's how that happens. We're just looking here at the Time Person of the Year cover from a couple of years ago. What was that moment like when this happened? Um, uh, time didn't tell me that that this you know the photo was taken at the committee to protect journalists award uh a few months in, in i think it was in november or december of 20 november of 2018 and i then, was there and i saw you speak yes. it was a great move, move moving moving speech that you gave and so go ahead well so i i didn't know and i actually found out on twitter and when I saw it on Twitter, it was dinner time here in the Philippines. I took it and sent it to our social media team to check whether it was a lie. Right? <laughs> We've been bombarded with so many lies. And then um, as soon as CNN has my number and they called me and wanted to put me on air and I had to like say, whoa, can you give me a few minutes because I got to figure this out. And when they did, when I picked up that phone and I realized it was real, the first thing that happened was, you know, I, I just, it's, my stomach sank because I thought, oh, my God, does this mean I'll be attacked even more, you know? And, uh, and, and so I just dealt with that, with that fear for a second before you just, got, you just have to embrace the, whatever it is that's thrown at you, right? So I went on air and I think I, I stumbled through a reaction, but um, it turned out to be the best shield. Because I think journalists, when they come under attack, or anyone who comes under attack, uh, your first response is to duck. I don't think this is that time. You know, even news organizations, when they're attacked online, they say, don't respond. This is not the time to do that. These are new times. And I think that, you know, you have to be transparent, far more transparent than we have ever been because only you can see what is happening on your feed. No one else does. So you have to tell people what's happening. And that's what I learned. I learned that um, I have to be far more transparent to say the things that are happening that are sometimes shocking. I've now shown you know, attacks that are uh, extremely venal and vicious and misogynistic and, and I just, you take it and Nietzsche's quote, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Uh, it's really true. It's happened to us in Rappler. It's happened to me. Um, and it brings you to some place new, which is where we all have to be. You know, the fact that you are doing all of these things online, uh, it's, it's fantastic. But at the same time, think about the chaos that we are dealing with online. How do we find facts? How do we find truth? Because if you can't find facts or truth, you can't have trust. How do we rebuild trust? Because that's the end goal of all of these disinformation networks is to tear down trust. And let's go back to the Russian military doctrine. If you can tear down trust, then the voice with the loudest megaphone wins. Then you actually tear down civic engagement because people won't know what direction to move in, right? So I think we're, we're in a new world. Sorry, I took us. I took us down a wrong. I'll shut up now. Sorry. No, please, no, never, uh, never shut up because you are a beacon of inspiration for so many people. Everyone who's watching right now, please share this. 
please tag your friends, please retweet. I believe Maria has already had a chance to share on Twitter and Facebook. Otherwise, she'll do it as we're talking here as well. And we're going to bring on Rose Horowitz, our producer, to talk to you. She runs Women to Follow, the hashtag which has been hugely influential and has brought, a, brought so much attention to the voices of women who are great on social and we should follow. So let's bring Rose. And Rose, hi. Rose, we're going to let you uh, come on in and join this party and ask some questions, please. Okay. Okay. Um, listening to Maria, I want to ask you, what do you see as your purpose now? I mean, I mean, I know you're fighting this battle in the Philippines, but what's the larger purpose of what you're fighting for? I think it's global. You know, the battle for truth, the mm -hmm. battle for facts, it's global. Um, I'm conflicted because, you know, we're living through this moment in history where uh, if you combine um, WhatsApp and Facebook together, you're talking about more than 3.2 million billion, more than 3.2 billion on on platforms. So we're no longer. I grew up at a time when each nation had its own vertical for communications of national uh, television networks or news organizations. Well, today, everything cuts across, right? And so something that is happening in New York or Delhi uh, happens instantaneously or just a few seconds delayed in Manila, right? So a lie told in one country spreads globally immediately. So. It, originally, we created Rappler in 2012, um, embracing this and really saying, this is fantastic. I drank the Kool-Aid. This is part of the reason Rappler grew so fast. But beginning in 2015, when, when news organizations went into Facebook on instant articles, right? This was built for news. And yet the same algorithms, the algorithms weren't changed. So facts were thrown into the system that actually prioritizes salacious emotional content. And facts just won't win, right? I mean, we spend our, or our entire career trying to make boring facts interesting because that's the job of journalism. Anyway, so um, now disinformation, the, if I look at the map, the information ecosystem of the Philippines, the disinformation networks have taken center stage and the news groups have been pushed to the periphery. So, uh, our dystopian present where a journalist can go to jail and it's not just six years, which is just one case. If you put all of the, the eight criminal charges together, cumulatively, the maximum penalty is almost a hundred years. Right. And I, I, you know, this is like watching a train wreck in slow motion and it's almost like a race against time. But I, I really feel like, We've lived through this in global history. And you know, if I don't get justice now, I will get justice later. I just hope it's fast enough to help me. But anyway, so our dystopian present is your dystopian. If it's not your present, it's going to soon be. It's your future because we're on the same information ecosystem. In fact, the reason why the Philippines was targeted, why our citizens were targeted is because we were test cases for America. You know, we're America's only colony. Protectorate is the right word, right? Uh, only former colony. And uh, um, we're 109 million people. Uh, we are, for the fifth year, we, Filipinos, spend the money globally. So Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, Chris Wiley, uh, Brittany Kaiser, another Cambridge Analytica whistleblower, both said we were a test case. We were the petri dish, according to Chris, and that when they tested tactics of mass manipulation here, uh, if it worked, they ported, that's his word, they ported it over to the United States and Europe. So whatever is happening to us, it's going to happen to you if it isn't happening already. India, my gosh, how can we forget India? you know, a, more than a billion people. Well, it's already happening to you also, <laughs> sorry. Um, but you know this, you're living through it, right? So, um, but can I add one thing about the Philippines, you know, and, and actually Sri asked this earlier, uh, you know, how does COVID affect us? It's just made it worse because we are now in our 
18th week, the end of the 18th week of a lockdown. And uh, three big things have happened. You know, people are stuck in their homes. Uh, the second is the largest broadcaster, ABS-CBN, was shut down by the government. And that process began on May 5th when we couldn't leave our homes and then cemented by a captured legislature in a vote of a working group committee in the ho our House of Representatives to deny the network its franchise. Uh, and then the third is an anti-terror law that essentially could get someone like me named a terrorist, depending on what a small group of cabinet secretaries want. Uh, they can designate anyone a terrorist and then they can jail that person, arrest without a warrant and detained up to 24 days. So we are at our end of times. This is the next few months will determine what kind of government we are going to have, whether our democracy lives or dies, whether I go to jail uh, in the same way that I guess the US elections, you know, you have your own elections coming up and your future will be determined by that as well at a time when the information ecosystem, when Facebook is still a behavioral modification system. So how the heck can people who are being manipulated choose when you don't have facts? Thank you. Uh, one of the things I just wanted, I think you would be a great person to clarify this. You know, our president Trump has said that has, you know, that he calls it fake news. But it's not, you know, that it's not, it's not fake news. It's what you say is this accumulation of untrue facts. And then he calls it fake news, but it's, it's misinformation, right? And, um, you know, if you could talk about that, you're the, our hero. No, Rose, first of all, thank you, thank you for, you know, for your support, because you've been pretty vocal on Twitter. Because I, I also, so look, I don't know, American news organizations call it misinformation. I call it disinformation because I think it's been proven that there are networks of disinformation that are actively working to manipulate us, whether you're the American public or whether you're the Filipino public. And then misinformation is what happens when the influence operations infects Let's use virus since we're living in a world of, of viruses, right? So let's call this, let's talk about this information ecosystem. And this virus of lies is released into the system and it infects real people because the end goal of influence operations is to change the way people think so that it changes the way they act. So when a leader, when when President Trump called CNN and the New York Times fake news, a week later, President Duterte called Rappler fake news, right? Even that is the wrong phrase. Look, um, it's shocking that leaders would do this. It actually shows you how they don't want to be held accountable because a normal, a leader in the in the olden days, a leader before the age of social media would actually have to respond to whatever the report is. Right? You'd have to take it on its merits. Now, no one responds, even if it's a, an investigative report. And there have been tons of investigative reports with President Trump and President Duterte. But they don't have to respond. They just bat it away using this phrase. Again, it goes back to influence operations. Uh, because if you tear down trust in that organization, uh, and, he, and President Trump has been doing this for a long time. If you tear down trust in that organization, then you don't ever have to answer the charges. Um, so that actually kills the whole idea of checks and balances of, of news organizations and journalists as the fourth estate, which is what Philippine and US democracies are built on, right? Checks and balances, because we know absolute power corrupts absolutely. Um, I will say the United States is in a better place because your institutions are stronger. You're fighting back better. But in the Philippines, our institutions essentially collapsed within the first six months. I think President Duterte is the most powerful uh, leader that we have had, powerful in the sense that he controls. <laughs> you know, um, when he attacked us in July of 2017 at his State of the Nation address, we got our first subpoena about a week later. It's almost like he gives verbal commands on air and then everything else follows. So 
Um, the captured legislature, well, that's proven by the vote against giving the largest broadcaster its franchise, right? So look, um, words matter. And that's actually what social media has proven. And social media's abdication of responsibility of protecting the public sphere has had a huge impact and has enabled the rise of these types of leaders and has made those on the front lines, the truth tellers, and it's not just journalists, right? Um, there are people, normal people who are trying to hold our government to account for the killings and the drug war. They just get pounded. They get pounded to silence and a fake bandwagon effect is created. I, I saw your um, interview with Duarte. I think you had two interviews with him and he looked at you straight and pointed his finger and said, journalism is bad. <laughs> Uh, can you, ref, you know, reflect on that and uh, how um, how can we combat this together? You know, India, the U.S., China. I mean, you know, in, in democracy because we've seen this, and I'm I'm wondering if you think that there's an opening because this need for truth and facts is so important now at this time of this unseen, unknown virus and. The Philipp you know, we are here. I mean, the president is being, our president is being held to account, you know, and he just wants to change the numbers. Like nobody, you know, states states don't have to report, you know, the, to the CDC, just send it in to me, I got it. But, right, so, um, but there's a demand because people are dying around the world. Yes. And the US has, what, a quarter of the cases leading the, the we, you know, we're the leader in that. Um, so is, do you see an opening in through COVID that leaders have to be accountable? So, you know, the, let's, let me throw a silver lining. And I actually think that you, you can do a lot in the United States because I think the first is who, who controls the distribution of news? Uh, because we can't actually hold our leaders to account if we're debating the facts. So the first step is, can you, can let's, let's please pressure Silicon Valley to be responsible for the public sphere so that people are not misled, so that people are not manipulated, so that they do not allow this with impunity. I think that's the first step. And, and I think the second step, you know, what you described is exactly what's happening in the Philippines. The numbers are getting fudged and our government has done this with the drug war, right? That's how we came under attack because we just kept reminding the government, the police and our public that look, this is what they said yesterday. This is what the new numbers are today. So the upside is that at a time when lies kill, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter have taken actions that they have never taken against political disinformation. You know, they've started taking down lies. They've started even with leaders labeling things, right? Because, you know, their inability to actually police the public sphere should not be our problem. Uh, but it is because that's the beginning of the erosion of democracy. So first is, can they extend this to the political sphere? Um, on, in Facebook, for example, the fact that they have allowed these things to happen has actually already resulted in genocide in Myanmar. That's proven. The UN sent in a team. They came out with a report. Facebook did its own report to verify that. And yet not, nothing, virtually nothing has really been done. Sri Lanka, the same. India, violence has happened. Um, and in the Philippines, we live with this, right? So that I think the first is, can we clean up our information ecosystem so that we are not in a fog so easily manipulated? I don't blame people uh, when we get manipulated because that's what these systems are supposed to do. You know, in the United States, it's already been proven. Russian disinformation networks have targeted Americans. In 2016, the Mueller report came out with this, documented the Senate Intelligence Committee released the data in 2018 publicly to show you, look at what's happened there. One of the targets that was pounded on two sides, on both sides, was Black Lives Matter. 
race and identity was pounded until it split wide open. And look at where we are four years later. The kinds of incremental attacks that killed the credibility of Hillary Clinton. These things are proven. What more do we want? The data is there. So, so the first is extend what is being done when lies kill in the age of COVID to political disinformation because the insidious effect of this behavioral modification system to manipulate people takes away the meaning of democracy. If people cannot make choices based on the same set of facts, we don't have democracy. We don't have integrity of elections. The second thing is journalists, news organizations. We have to keep doing our jobs, even if sometimes we're throwing it into a black hole because the distribution platforms just, even if you're correcting a fact, I mean, you're, you know, you're correcting a lie. Um, we're one of Facebook's fact checking partners. The fact check doesn't spread as far and as fast as the lie. That's a given again. Right? So these designs in that need to be changed. And then I think the third part is the coalition of governments standing up for the principles of democracy. It's very belated. The first time governments actually did this was July last year when Britain and Canada came together and they, they had this meeting in London. And, you know, shocking. I, there was just a statement of this global media freedom coalition. And the United States was not there. That's so shocking to me. They gave a statement on the Philippines. Let me rewind that on, on what's happened here. And it was just released in early July. And Canada, Britain, Australia, I mean, there were all these countries who stood up for democracy. And I'm just I was shocked that the United States wasn't there. Anyway, so we have to remember this is a this is a fight not just about the nuts and bolts of the facts, but it's about principles, right? We've been through this before globally. We fought this before, the rise of tyranny, and that pendulum is swinging again, enabled by technology. And do we fight the good fight or do we just give up and say it's too hard? We can't do that. And so journalists, activists, uh, you know, artists, citizens, this is it. This is the battle for facts. This is the battle for truth. This is the battle for democracy. The battle for democracy. Thank you so much. Maria, we have about 25 minutes left with Maria. She's so kind to spend time with us, especially in a busy week as she's fighting multiple crises at the same time, covering multiple crises. So this is the part of the show, Maria, where we call what we call our global tour, where people say hello from around the world. And if you know any of these people, of course, please say hello. But also if you've been to any of the places they're watching from, it'll be nice to hear your reminiscences about them. And we also want to tell everybody about your connection to America. You have a direct connection to America because? I, my family left the Philippines when martial law was declared in the 70s. And I grew up in the United States. I came back to the Philippines in 1986 when people power happened. So I grew up in Tom River, New Jersey. I went to public school. I went to college in, this, in the US. I'm a product of both worlds. I think like, like, like all, we, we come from more than one world. It's great training for journalism when you see the world from more than one position. It certainly is. So let's take a look at some of the people watching. Rahajan says, hello, good evening from Long Island. My father was Indonesian from Bandung and my mother was Filipino from Masin in the Western Visayas. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing any of those things. Selamat pagi, Rahajan. Saya tinggal di Jakarta 10 tahun. I lived there for 10 years, so it's so wonderful to see you uh, combine both worlds in the United States. How funny, you put my three worlds together. Very, hello. <laughs> and he was a guest on our, on our episode, July 4th, what it means, what America means to me. What's your favorite memory of New York City and a restaurant that you would like to go to when you come next to New York? My God, so many. Uh, uh, I can't even think of one. There's so many places. New York. So I, I was a starving student in New York. <laughs> That's my memory. <laughs> um, I, I really grew up outside the United States. Now I became a journalist outside. But um, I love rooftop restaurants. Uh, there's an outdoor um, 
in the in in the Chinatown area, there's this uh, rooftop restaurant. Um, it's it's one of my favorite spots in New York City. I want to go back there. Nice. Uh, uh, Jonathan, by the way, has been watching for 134 straight days of the show, so he's a dedicated viewer. And Mark is watching from Durham, North Carolina. Have you been to North Carolina? I haven't, um, but I can imagine your accent, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark has also been a guest on our show, and he taught us how to be an ally of African Americans at this moment. So we're very grateful to Mark. Uh, Stefan is tagging one of our Filipino friends. Ashok is watching from Kerala in India. Have you been? Uh, not Kerala, but certainly New Delhi. I've gone through, I've, I've reported from there, but and other parts of India first when I was still with CNN. So, But we've got to get you to the South. My parents live in Kerala, so we've got to get you there. It's called God's Own Country. Wow. <laughs> Padmini is watching from Austin. Have you been? Yes. <laughs> yes, um, and I was supposed to have been there for, um, for, uh, gosh, the festival that didn't happen. South by Southwest. South by Southwest this yeah. this year, so many things canceled. So I, we were hoping that that would push through. In yeah, fact, that was one of the last things to be canceled, right? You know that, yeah. Yes, yes. The film, the documentary film, where we had a Ramona Diaz following us for a year and a half. It's been edited in Austin. Nice. Later, you know, lives there. Nice. Uh, uh, Rajan is linking to uh, Filipino Americans, the Latinos of Asia, how Filipino Americans break the rules of race. And that's one of the things uh, that you know from a lot of Filipino Americans, their names sound Hispanic. And so people yeah. think they're Hispanic. Can you just, for people who don't know that history, can you just tie it all together for us? Uh, you know, there was this saying that the Philippines spent 300 years in a convent and 50 years in Hollywood. Uh, we were under Spanish colonial rule for 300 years and then a protectorate, the only former colony of the United States. Um, and then and then here we are, our, our fragile democracy. So yes, um, that's correct, Rahajan. I'm curious, you know, I, my email is just my name at rapper.com. I would love it if you let me know. It'd be interesting to see how you see the world because even just the Philippines and Indonesia together is fascinating. It's a great mix, um, but the religions are complete opposite, right? Catholic versus Islam. Indonesia being the world's largest Muslim has the world's largest Muslim population, and then um, and then living in the United States. These are all. You must be really an, an interesting person. <laughs> And he worked at the New York Times for many years and is a, is a great advocate for uh, kind of care, health care at this time. Uh, his mother was a, a nurse uh, for 50 years and she unfortunately passed uh, during, uh, you know, at, from COVID in a nursing home. And he, she, she shared the story with us and he has shared how angry he feels that he didn't get to say goodbye properly as so many people did not get to say goodbye properly in the middle of all of this. And that's that crisis on top of everything else that we're talking about. And uh, he's also been tagging so many folks, look at it, people tagging their friends, everybody please do this. And Jonathan tells me we're now starting the 20th week. We have not thought about that here as we're doing this. Look at all these tags of their friends. And um, uh, Ashok is wishing Rose a happy birthday in advance. And uh, Ashok is calling you Maria ma'am. In India, that's what they say, ma'am. So there, there you go. And you're you're welcome to Kerala, I'm sure. And uh, we're seeing everyone tagging their friends. And he says, we're very proud, feel really proud of meeting you. So isn't that very special? Look at India connecting here as well. And London is quoting you, in today's landscape, when we have to literally fight for the facts, journalists are activists. Okay, now, are you allowed to tell us what you last did in Vegas? <laughs> um, it was actually a reunion with my sister. My, one of my sisters uh, lives in LA and we drove to Las Vegas just to, to meet another sister who lives on the East Coast. So I was there, it was my first time in Las Vegas. <laughs> this was a few years ago, four or five years ago, before all of this happened, before the world changed so drastically. Short giant one, un unusual name says, what, what, how can we help? In your area of influence, make sure facts rule, right? Because I think sometimes we think it's not worth doing that. I, I actually think the question I ask everyone right now is, what are you willing to sacrifice for the facts, for the truth, 
What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? Because that's the battle that we're fighting. Um, so that's that's not just it's not just our battle. It is yours. Um, in terms of Rappler, we've survived four years of attacks because of the kindness of strangers. Our legal fees, as you know, has escalated. You know, we've gone as as much as forty thousand dollars a month, and yeah, like I said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Our community has poured in. We crowdfunded how to pay our legal fees. So there's there's that. There's rappercom slash crowdfunding. You can look at it. But I think in general, we're going to have to do this the way the internet does it, which is if we can take our area of influence and clean it up, then we can connect those. So there's that. We have to do it bottom up. At the same time, we have to demand accountability from social media platforms because they have enabled this. Their decisions, which which uh, amplify, which bring in a lot of money, right? I mean, these decisions have crippled us and have manipulated us, and that really should stop. That is that is so special. Uh, Sony says she inspired us. The stunning presentation by Maria made our students ignited. How to describe her? A gentle human with a courageous move for humanity. We're really proud of her. Sony Jalarajan says that. So I don't know if you remember the interaction, but you have you you travel so much, so you may not remember everyone you've met, but everyone remembers you. Apollo says, "Wow!" and accolades as justification for professional attacks. And again, people are just sharing and sharing. Uh, Stefan says, "Maria, you are a phenomenal human being and journalist, and thank the heavens for your spirit, skill, and strength. Always keeping you in my thoughts. You inspire so many around the world. Thank you." I think he captures what we're saying here. I'm not sure who this is. Proud to have Maria at our university as a distinguished scholar. You probably more than one university, but which one is this? This might be Yale. That was the last the last thing that I had done. Actually in, in February or the end of February. So no, no, thank you. Distinguished scholar, that could also be Singapore, not NTU, Nanyang Technological. So I, I, I don't. Thank you. First of all, it's it's very it's difficult to listen because I don't think I'm doing anything other. I think a lot of people are doing what I'm doing, and I hope you are in your area of influence. I hate coming of age at this time. If I could, I would. I if I could, I would duck. I just can't, right? Because then that would make my entire life and my career a lie, and I'm not willing to do that. So we salute you for what you're doing. Tim is quoting you, facts just don't win. Ashok says the battle is global as we in India too face the same threats. Press freedom is under attack here in India as well. And uh, and Mark says it's been interesting watching journalists try to separate their personal opinion on social media from their news coverage. What is the rule at Rappler in terms of uh, how you teach your staff how to handle social? And what is the meaning of Rappler? Uh, so Rappler was, uh, we even had a debate, do you make up a name for a news group? I wanted to, to call our group Ripple, but um, my Filipino co-founder said, Maria, we're in the Philippines, that will become Nipple. <laughs> I was like, how does that work? Um, anyway, so I, I for Rappler comes from rap, the 80s, rap to talk, plus Ripple to make waves. That's, that's oh, nice. yeah. Um, but um, the thing that you said about uh, the line between, we're very, we're traditional in the sense of standards and ethics. It's labeled on our site, right? An opinion piece is an opinion piece. Uh, if it has facts, if it is an analysis of facts, we call it analysis. It's an analysis. It's under thought leaders. Um, journalists, I think uh, our work today is not just about delivering the facts, which is what dictators or, or people in power want you to think. They want you to think that facts are given without anything, right? But this isn't Sorry, I've just I've, I've picked up on, you know, that this is, you're just supposed to do that. That is wrong. Context is everything. The journalist's job is to tell you why this is happening, that context is incredibly important. We face this in the Philippines all the time. They said, just give us the numbers. It isn't about that. What if these numbers have been manipulated? You have to say that. Then you have to say why. The whys is why journalists train all their lives to be journalists. You know, you're not a stenographer. Um, it, when I got the CPJ award, when you were there, Sri, I, I actually quoted Christian Amanpour, 
the year before she got the award and she said, be truthful, not neutral. Because facts aren't neutral. You know, glass half empty or half full, depending on, you know, context, you will choose this. So that's what journalists do. We tell you the context and we tell you why. Thank you. Let's bring in Rose so that Rose can also ask another question. Uh, let's bring her in here. Go ahead, Rose. Uh, I just want to say on a personal note that I was an editor at a paper in New York City when uh, in 19, I guess I just started my career in 1986. And we, we reported uh, the downfall of Marcos and the um, election of Aquino, Aquino, Aquino. Um, and, uh, and I have a good friend who I went to Columbia with who is Filipino and uh, we stayed in touch. So, so hopefully someday I will make it to your country. So, thank you. Uh, and I will ask you as a woman, what has it been like and how, is it, how has it been different for you in fighting this battle against Duarte and this misogynistic culture that you're talking about? Look, I spent uh, almost 20 years with CNN and I went, I was a conflict reporter. I covered every, you know, sectarian, whether it's uh, a, a, a battle for independence. There were five different types of conflicts I covered uh, in the region. And a war zone doesn't compare to what we're facing today. This is worse than a war zone because it's, it's personal. Right, uh, the time I was with CNN, you can hide. The network is at the front, and the network protects you, so you can tell the truth, regardless of who is displeased. The network stands in front of you. Today, that's gone. You know, this is very personal, and I really, truly worry about how it's changing our values, not just in the Philippines, in the United States, when the leader rolls back everything that we had fought so hard for in the last decades, right? All of the progress of, of inclusivity of, I, I'm, the kinds of attacks that I get on social media, the kinds of attacks women get. Women in the Philippines are attacked at least 10 times more than men. And the attacks are sex, like our president and yours, sexist at best, misogynists misogynistic at worst. I have, you know, there are names that, that first I was called every single animal that you can think of. And then I became an animal, you know, my, my facial features, my skin tone. I, I have extremely dry skin. You can't see it now because I actually slept, you know, but when I'm under stress, very bad for a journalist. Um, my, I have eczema, really dry skin. That's been weaponized against me, right? And the end goal of all of this is to dehumanize the target. And again, let's go back in time. We saw this in Nazi Germany when the same tactics were used against the Jews. Because if you can dehumanize somebody, then anything is possible. That means it's not just online violence, but violence. Right? So, so this is why it's extremely dangerous. And I'm I, I'm, this is why I'm, I'm shocked that the platforms aren't doing more. Hate speech is hate speech. It dehumanizes. And the impact is personal and societal. It, it's rolling back the gains we have made in the last few decades. And that's shocking. Um, the way to deal with it, if you're under attack, is to take whatever it is you're most afraid of. Because you know they're going to come after you that way. And then I... It, I actually look at everything and I make sure that I can handle it, right? So that sounds really like weird, but there are two ways you can deal with it. You can shut off, in which case then this will take over the narrative or you can confront it. And what I've done, you know, there are times when you can't take it. So you shut off for a day or two, but I don't want it to, to be, I want to know what's happening and how they're attacking me. And then I want to diffuse it. So I said this, I gave the, the commencement speech for the class of 2020 at Princeton this year. And I, I said, this is a lesson I learned when I was still being bullied in an elementary school, right? Uh, you embrace your fear. Whatever it is you're most afraid of, you, you touch it and you embrace it. You hold it and you take the sting out. And that will not just diff take away the attacks. It will also make you stronger. You can't win everything. And sometimes it takes a while to get over it. Like, going to jail, 
I started dealing with that a year ago and I'm okay, right? Because if I wasn't okay, then I can't confront it. Very, very moving words. Uh, when you see or what's happening in America now, what's happening in Portland and what the administration has said they want to do in uh, in other cities, in Chicago, in other cities, you know, what, 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 what's your reaction? Are you surprised as an American, as, you know, somebody with dual citizenship? It's shocking. It's shocking because the United States was the beacon, you know, uh, and f actually this proves to me that uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely the power. What's happening after social media allowed this kind of disinformation, these influence operations, is that power then gets more power. What we're seeing this in the Philippines, the consolidation of power, and we're seeing the different phases of it. In in your country, I, 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 I'm just shocked because this is the country that taught us maximum restraint. This is the country that taught us principles, right? I, yeah. So I hope America finds its way to its values. You know, it because if you get lost, it has a global impact. And what do you, I think you, there's a quote, you know, what, what is your warning and what should we in America, the journalism community know and what can we do right now, would you say? <laughs> Demand accountability from Silicon Valley. That's one, report it. We're not reporting what's happening online because we are, because journalists, news organizations have power. We, we were part of the power structure as the fourth estate. And we like power, kind of looked away from what technology had done. So I would think more needs to get done. There's a lot more academic research there, but people don't realize that social media is really a behavioral modification system. And let me quickly talk about that, right? Uh, this behavioral modification system knows you far better than you know yourself because we, when we put in our data, our machine learning and artificial intelligence takes that. And with a kind of micro-targeting, it, it takes our most vulnerable moment to a message whether that message is from a company or from a government. And then it serves us up at that most vulnerable moment. It gives us the content that has been paid for to change the way we think, how we feel, and ultimately the way we act, right? This is a behavioral modification system. And the systems of laws are so flawed that it has eroded democracy. It has killed democracy. Look. I say this again, what is happening in the Philippines is not different from what is happening in every country. Our dystopian present is your dystopian future. You must do something about it. And for journalists, we've never been as under attack as we are today. It is personal, they're personal and vicious attacks. But I think that's part of the reason we need to collaborate far more than we ever have in the past. We need to collaborate with citizens, with truth tellers, and um, we need to build what the present and the future is going to look like. We're standing on the rubble of the past. This old world, it's gone, and we have to actively build it. You guys, by doing what you're doing every day for 130 plus days, you know, this is new. No one could have done this just online, right? So how do we do this? How, what, what is it? What are the standards and ethics? I think now journalists are no longer the gatekeepers. How do we fix this information ecosystem? How do we bring back trust when the end goal is to kill trust, right? So these are huge questions. And I think the last part that we have to do is, you know, after World War II, which is when humanity unleashed evil onto itself, right? We, you know, after the after the the Hiroshima, after everything horrific about World War II, the world came together. And when we did that, we came out with some things 
to prevent this from happening again. Things like Bretton Woods, NATO, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, which so many of our countries are part of. And the world got better. We knew we needed to prevent humanity from unleashing its evil on humanity, right? So today that's happened again, and it's happened insidiously. Our information ecosystem, an, an atom bomb went off in it, and we're pretending or we don't realize that that's actually happened. So I think we have a lot of work to do, and it, it's a global, it's global in nature. Thank you. We just we know how busy you are. We know you need to leave, but I do want to show you a couple of quick comments here. Billy says one person can create a ripple. Well, you created a wave. So nice play on on that. And uh, Apollo is uh, linking to a Mark Twain quote: "A lie can travel around the world and back again, while truth is putting on its pants." Right? Like that's and <laughs> that's far worse than it is today, right? It's exponential yeah. lies, right? So you don't even get to breathe before the lie has traveled. <laughs> right. And Lost Dot says, "Damn straight, context is important." And we are having so many questions and comments coming through. Hundreds of posts here. Uh, Rajan says, "Maria, during your time as CNN Jakarta bureau chief, you may have spoken to my cousin Sunarti Hartono, who was vice chairman of Indonesia's." National Ombudsman Commission of Indonesia beginning about 2000. I believe I did. Yeah. And Rajan says, I hope America finds its way to its values. I think that's uh, so important. So as we get ready to uh, take your leave and let you get back to your very important work that you're doing, leave us with some thoughts and, uh, and then we'll have uh, Rose ask you a final question. So I think that um, COVID-19 exacerbated what was already flawed in every one of our societies, the things we have always known we needed to fix, right? And I think that, you know, we all know all of the things that are that the negative effects. And I, I don't want us to end with that, because I think that if we think about it, this can also be an extremely empowering time. Digitalization was forced immediately, right? Rappler embraced this in 2012, but now the entire world, we're locked down and we have this, this screen. So I think let's embrace this, right? We are actually living through a historic moment. We will look back on this for years and years and years. And the question for each of us is, you know, how can we imagine how much better the world can be? Right? Can we imagine a better world that is more sustainable, that is more equal, that is more empathetic, that's more compassionate? And I think that's that's what we should do. You know, it's it's journalists for a long time we focus. People say we focus on the negative because because the job of journalism is about holding power to account. It is about justice. So what what do we do today? And I think that's every person's task. What are you willing to sacrifice for the truth? Thank you so much. So honored that you joined us, Maria. Um, I guess you've spoken of this, the world's problems, the Philippines problems. Uh, can I ask you as, how do you, how do you go on every day? How, and what, what inspiration, you know, is there, is there, does this, the larger goal motivate you every day? Or are there some personal things that you do that that keep you um, sane? I, may I just add that she's so positive and has such great energy and and positivity that she's imbibing all of us with that. I uh, want to learn how you do that too. Like, uh, how is that possible for somebody facing so many problems uh, that are coming at you in so many directions? Thank you. Well, thank you for, for the question. Thank you for having me, you know. So so first is I think I've always been glass half full, always. Um, and particularly now we have to be. And I guess part of that is first embrace the reality we live, we live in. I, I, and I, I list down all of the problems and then I do the Pareto principle. Where can I spend 20% of my time which will deliver 80% of the results? Um, ah, if the glass is half full, then you can see the things that are positive in this, you know, but I, I guess what, how do I move forward? I know it matters. This time matters, right? So I want to do the best that I can do. 
at this moment in time. And I, I have some amazing people working with me. Rappler is forged in fire. We can prove that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's tiring, but my gosh, the purpose is so clear. The mission is so clear. What's at stake is so clear. So last is this. One of my favorite books when I was, when my senior year in college was, or, or afterwards, I can't remember exactly when, but I read Barbara Tuckman's book, The March of Folly. You remember that one? That, that uh, we look at history and she looked at history. So in the last two days, I went back and I just tweeted this. I, I'll send it. I went back over all my old history books, the history of Philippine democracy. And what's shocking to me is that there's so many things that are happening again. Um, and this move to tyranny, to fascism globally is happening again. So the first thing I did was to look at Tim Snyder's work on tyranny and look at the prescriptive things. Do not give up your rights. That's one of the first things. Um, and then now I'm looking at the Philippines and shocked at this. We got to go back and look at history because we're really, we're at back to the future, right? We've been through this cycle before. So all of us on the front lines, because all of us are on the front lines in the age of social media, let's go back and look at what we should be doing, what we need to accomplish to protect our democracy. Thank you so much. We are showing your Twitter handle right now on screen. Maria Ressa, please follow her. Idealist, skeptic, pragmatist, journalist, author, and CEO of Rappler, hero to so many all over the world, including all of us who are watching the show right now. Thank you very much, Maria. We want to let you get back to your day, and we want to say thank you so much for your efforts, and please keep us posted on everything. We are following very carefully. Your American family, your international family is with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you. Bye-bye. And folks, please stick around. Uh, we're gonna have a quick chat here, just me and Rose. And then we're going to tell you uh, about what we normally do on this show every single day. We say their names. We talk to Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, who asked, who I asked, how can we be allies? And she said, say their names, the victims of police brutality. And we will say their names in a couple of minutes, but we also wanna tell you what's coming up tomorrow we have a fabulous show. I don't know if Rose has had time to see this yet, but this is a show called Indian Matchmaking, and it's a top 10 global show. And Smithy Mundra will be with us, executive producer of Indian Matchmaking and the Oscar-nominated director of St. Louis Superman. And Vyasar Ganeshan is a participant in the show. I don't know what you call them, Rose, when someone's on a uh, reality show. They're not actors. They're, I don't know what's a word. So our, our colleague Vandana came up with participant. What do you think is a good word for that? They're not acting, right? Or some of them are acting in some of these. Yeah, show, showrunner? Oh, uh, showrunner is the organizer, yeah. it, right? So show mm -hmm. participant, I guess. So Vandana had a good word. And this is part of a new series we're launching once a month with this wonderful organization in diaspora. And in diaspora, I want to tell you, is a terrific organization uh, that a nonprofit established to transform the success of Indian diaspora into meaningful impact worldwide. Their members are a powerful network of diaspora leaders from diverse backgrounds and professions who are committed to building stronger communities with a culture of giving and inspiring social change. And so please join us at 9 p.m. Eastern. You're going to have a great time. We'll talk about this show, Top 10 Worldwide Netflix show, Indian Matchmaking. I'm going to suggest to Rose that she spend the next 12 hours just watching this show, but that's at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we are just super excited. And Rose, for the first time, my kids are excited about our shows because they know this show, and uh, I think we're going to be famous in certain, uh, certain demographics because we're doing the show tomorrow. But let's talk a little bit about Maria. How did you get her for us? Such a a timely interview. Talk about that for a couple of minutes, please. Well, I've been following her, of course, you know, um, when I think when she in 2016, when she uh, got that award and, uh, you know, just as a beacon of of hope and, um, you know, somebody who's a hero um, to journalists and to democracy. So I've been following her closely on Twitter. 
And I thought, well, she would be a great guest. <laughs> and I, I sort of, you know, I picked up more of her Twitter, but I, she's, I think she, she was one of our, my women to follow that, you know, has been on our list, of course. So, uh, and in her interview, she, she said Rose is very active on Twitter. So I think that she um, respected that. And uh, I just messaged her, you know, I direct messaged her and said, introduced, introduced myself, introduced our show and asked her if she could be on it. And she said, yes. <laughs> and I think you called me right away, which you know, right away when I told you. And, um, and then I wasn't sure because we didn't hear from her for about a week and I was seeing what was going on in in Manila and you know with COVID but also with her case and about one o'clock on Monday night or Tuesday no the day before her the day before she she said I'm preparing for court right now so I can't talk long <laughs> but if you haven't heard from my assistant that it's a no it's a yes <laughs> so. well you you're an amazing producer, but you're also a great guest booker. We had uh, a, a great, very timely show this week. I mean, we always have timely episodes, but we had a very unusual show on Monday. We did Portland in crisis. And then on Tuesday, we talked about change and you found us this young lady, 17 years old, talking about how she started a petition and Trader Joe's has changed some of the, or is changing some of its names of products like Trader Joe-san and Trader Arabian Joe and things like that. By the way, we got so many trolls coming after her and coming and saying this is, you know, doing this is racist. And the funny part is the company is actually doing, understands, and just like the Aunt Jemima changes, they're changing. But there are all these people who in the middle of this pandemic have decided that this is the cause that they want to fight and are fighting the 17-year-old girl, uh, young lady, as she is, uh, trying to just affect change. And we talked about how do you make change? So you've been just so good at finding us guests. For those of you who haven't seen, our show has had 234 guests in the first 125 days, and that's almost 10 days ago. So we probably had another 15 guests since then. You and Vandana are an amazing team. And you stopped by one day when we were starting and you said, I want to help. And either the most interesting decision you ever made or the worst decision you ever made offering to help? Uh, I think it was the best decision. I love news and, um, you know, I've been covering it, but as a freelancer, it's harder to cover. I, I think, you know, I used to have like that wall that, that Maria talked about when I did investigative stories, which I, I've done, and I had the backing of a huge newspaper chain, but that's, you know, that's disappearing. There are only a few newspapers that I think the Oregonian, which we we for that show in Portland, we had um, a reporter, and I think I, I saw that they're family owned, so that is a rarity uh, because local news is just disappearing. And what the journalist um, Eater said in the, in the show was to say, really, the credit goes to these uh, unpaid. Uh, unpaid inter you know unpaid people looking for to tell the truth uh because newspaper even the their good newspaper and a good public radio station can't cover this because as i guess maria said you know transparency is so important and these journalists who are you know just in the street following like the, the wall of moms they are shedding light for all of us. They're being transparent. And this reporter I thought was so uh, really transparent. I wondered if his editor was gonna kill him the next day because you know, he came on and said, you know, we're, we have to let go this intern, but he, he did this fantastic video for us and hire him. So um, it's very generous, but it's, um, it's, you know, it's troubling to see. But it, it, and the, and the, and then the good thing about, like Maria said, we have done this show every day and we were talking about inclusivity, you know, from the, from the get go. So I'm proud of that. Yeah. Look at these numbers so that, you know, we, we're going to do even better. We had 143 out of <laughs> the first 234 guests, by the way, we haven't looked, we probably hit 250. We should have made a bigger deal about the person who was our 250th guest. One of the things that about doing a show every day is that we don't have time to do the right thing, which is promote the heck before 
and then promote the heck out of it after because there's no time. We're just moving forward. And this is people think that this is our full time job. The show, it is part of what we're doing. You're writing, you're working with us, you're producing other shows, you're making She's On Call, you're working with Carnegie Corporation on our seminars with them. So people don't understand that we are like a very, you know, small, tiny, tiny uh, unit trying to shed light on everything that's happening in the middle of everything that's happening. Absolutely, three 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 person team here doing the show every day, and like you said, we're do, we're doing lots of other things, uh, and that's I, I don't think I'll you know uh, something I'll always remember that this this effort, and you know it's exciting in a way. Be, like I was following Maria's day in court, and she went on live. I was driving home from a friend's, like uh, a very rare like. I, I went in her pool. It was so cool and so hot. <laughs> you know, so we just walked, we just swam for three hours in her pool. <laughs> and on my way back, I, I got a live notice on my phone, and it said Maria. You know, Maria was was going live in her car on the way to the courthouse. And I pulled over, because you know, we couldn't tweet that. But I pulled over and 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 live, you know, and tweeted her live tweet. Um, with something she said in it, and um, it was very exciting. That and and the freedom, you know, the the way the the access to media, and the, you know, the the good side is that you know we can all be journalists and we can all be uh, reporting numbers and facts uh, and trying to uh, bring the truth, you know, trying to be uh, to enhance our democracy and report the truth. Yeah, and you, you certainly have. Stefan says, incredible work, Rose. Way to go. Apollo says, good work, Rose, on finding the guests. And thank you both and Vandana for this amazing show. And Apollo was a guest on our show about life under COVID in Vegas. And he was fantastic. If folks, you should uh, check that video out. All our shows are on our archive. 134 shows plus our New York Times read along. And but before we say her names and say the and 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 talk about that i just want you to uh give a a shout out to the show that you're producing she's on call uh it's a great show um these these two women doctors who are one i guess they're both surgeons um one is an ent specialist and marina is a, a general surgeon at, at nyu um you know nyu langone hospital are, you know, it's sort of, um, they know each other well, so they have a great rapport. And it's kind of like the view, um, you know, the view meets um, General Hospital, I don't, you know, uh, Gray's Anatomy, where, you know, we kind of get this inside look at what it's like to be a doctor. And I mean, I think we will get there, but you know, there's been so much news to cover in terms of uh, COVID and COVID-19 talking about that. Uh, and I'm um, very excited this coming weekend, we have three um, fabulous guests and it's a really special program because it's, it's the first one that we're doing about a theme and the one, this theme is school opening, which is of concern to everyone. Uh, I now have two students in college. Um, one just found out there's no swim team, <laughs> there's no competition and you know, he sort of lives for swimming. Um, and the other one is an actor and, you know, I don't think there'll be any live uh, theater. For a while. Uh, so, so the three doctors are, one is the, uh, her name her, is Dr. Goza. She is the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a great get. And I asked uh, Sujana how she got her today at our call. And uh, the other is the head of the national, I'm not sure of the acronym, but it's the, the Association of School Nurses. Oh, they, there's the card, yes. And um, the other is, and the third is a, um, a specialist in um, diseases and viruses. So we are really excited about the show and we're planning how we're going to do it and, uh, you know, what we hope they talk about. So that's, I, I think everyone will want to watch the show. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody should watch the show as well. And you're doing a fantastic job as a producer along with Vandana. And then let's not forget Sunday before 
we go to She's On Call. We have the New York Times read along. We've been reading the Sunday New York Times out loud like crazy people for five years. And Anthony Tapama, legendary New York Times journalist and author, is going to be with us. Our focus is going to be Cuba, Latin America, and so much more. Anthony Tapama, please watch 8.30 a.m. Eastern time, and then you can switch right over to She's On Call. And then don't forget, tomorrow night is Indian Matchmaking, a top 10 Netflix show, Smithy Mundra and Vyasar Ganeshan will be with us as we launch our special series once a month within Diaspora. And big, big thanks to Scroll.in for all we're able to do together. So Rose, I'm gonna let you go. I have to go watch Indian Matchmaking. Yes, exactly. And so I'll let you go. Thank you so much, Rose. Thank You're you. awesome. And it's, it's a real uh, treat and a real honor to work with you and Vandana on the show for 134 days. When our grandkids ask us, what did you do during the pandemic? We'll have a darn good answer. <laughs> and Vandana will have a um, great grand, you know, she'll, she'll have years and years to tell this story. <laughs> yes, she will. Thank you so much. Bye, Thank Rose. You. Folks, Rose Horowitz and Maria Ressa, two great women to follow, two great journalists to follow. Please follow them, Rose Horowitz 31 and Maria Ressa. So now we come to the portion of the show where we say their names. I asked Kimberly Crenshaw, the wonderfully talented, influential professor of law professor at Columbia uh, who coined the term intersectionality. I asked her on one of our shows, we said, please tell us what we can do as allies. And she said, say their names. And so we have been saying their names. First, we've been saying it by reading the names off of this Time Magazine cover. That's a stunning cover on the left, Maria sorry, Titus Kaffer's uh, painting. And on the right, you see young George Floyd with his mother, Larcinia Floyd. She would die two years before he would be killed, almost to the day. And now they're buried next to each other in Houston. But now we're going to say her name. This is from the updated Say Her Name report that Rajan and others have pointed us to. Thank you all so much for being here and thank you as we read these names. They mean so much to us that we're able to do this. And please, as you listen, think if you've heard these names, you have heard of lots of the men who have been killed and you have not heard as much about many of the women. Here we go. Brianna Taylor, Tatiana Jefferson, Charlena Siobhan Lyles, Corin Gaines, India Kager, Sandra Bland, Alexia Christian, Maya Hall, Megan Hockaday, Janisha Fonville, Natasha McKenna, Tanisha Anderson, Aura Rosser, Shanique Proctor, Michelle Cousseau, Hurley Golden, Gabriela Navarez, Yvette Smith, Renisha McBride, Miriam Carey, Kayam Livingston, Kayla Moore, Shelley Fry, Melissa Williams, Shulena Weldon, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Charmel Edwards, Rekia Boyd, Cherise Francis, Ayana Stanley Jones, Tarika Wilson, Katherine Johnston, Alberta Spruill, Kendra James, Latanya Haggerty, Margaret Laverne Mitchell, Taisha Miller, Danette Daniels, Frankie Ann Perkins, Sanji Taylor, Eleanor Bumpers, killed by police October 29th, 1984. How many of these names do you know? How many of these stories do you know? And that's why we say their names. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for supporting the show for 134 days. We've learned so much bringing this together for you and we're so grateful for your support. We're always looking for story ideas. We're looking for guest ideas, theme ideas, and sponsor ideas. Please email me, sri at sri.net, S-R-E-E -E at S-R-E-E.net. Please check out our YouTube archive and please hit subscribe and follow me on Twitter at sri and Instagram is Srinet, and please connect with us on LinkedIn as well. One of the ways that you can keep up with everything we do 
is to get on our WhatsApp alert system. So this is not a WhatsApp group. This is just a very light touch reminder every single time that we're online and on the air. So just hold up your phone and use the QR code and you will be directed to WhatsApp. And if you have WhatsApp, you can get a gentle alert every single time. We are so grateful to everyone who supports the show and that's one way you can support the show. And this is, I have not had the time to fix this. So this is not the way I should be coming on here, but I'm just so grateful to all of you. I'm also a little tired. That's why it feels good to put my elbow down. Thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you soon. And we'll say goodbye right now to all of you. Please join us tomorrow for our very special episode that is coming up on Indian matchmaking. Tell your friends a worldwide top 10 show. Indian matchmaking will be the topic of our conversation. Smithy Mundra, executive producer and Oscar nominated director of St. Louis Superman, the Asur Ganeshan, who's a participant in Indian matchmaking, will be here, as will M. R. Rangaswamy, founder of Indiaspora, as we do a new monthly series. And we're so excited about the show. Join us tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you very, very soon. The comments still keep coming in. Apollo says, have an awesome night. Roberta says, you are amazing. You are amazing, Roberta. Diane has been a great supporter and dear friend. Thank you, Sri, she says. And so many people are here and watching. And look at this. Tim says, Rose rocks. And so many people watching. Radian says, I'll make sure all my family and friends with school age children tune in on Sunday, 11 a.m. for She's on Call. And, uh, and Maz says, please make this available in a podcast format. Originally, I hated the podcast to bits owning on their sheer lengths, but since the ongoing pandemic, so we will definitely come to you and uh, have a podcast version so you can listen as well. And with that, let's say goodbye and say goodnight to all of you. Thanks very much, everybody. I am so grateful to every single person who has watched, who has supported us. Thank you. And please email me. Let's connect. Let's collaborate. Let's do something great together. Bye, everybody.